I mean, that's a classic thing. Okay, folks. Our second day together. Everybody able to get on the DD Learn? Okay. No? Okay, yeah. Okay. So, there's no assignments this week, and some of you came up like, oh, wow. You reminded us to read the chapter before we came to class, but you sent it like an hour and a half before class started. <laughs> so again, this is to try to get you in the mode, all right, of how I really want you to tackle this class. So I'd like for you to be reading chapter one, ideally before today. The good news is, is next week we don't have class. So if you haven't finished chapter one, I would read it. There might be some terms today that we introduce that are going to be a little foreign to you. Okay, some vocabulary that you would have picked up in the in the chapter reading, but if you didn't do it, you know, we'll pause and try to, to describe it. But as we pick up momentum for the semester, we're not going to be able to do that every single lecture. Okay, so the idea is I want you reading before you come and previewing the slide before you show up, so you know what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about. And on Monday, I told you this is where we would leave off. Um, so. Another pet peeve of mine is faculty we like to have a schedule. If we get a little behind, then we go through like rapid fire slide action. You guys know what I'm talking about? We're just like, right? All right, you guys get it? Any questions? And we just like motor through like 15 slides in like two minutes. So I will try not to do that. What I'd rather do is go at the pace that we go. We hit the pause button and we pick it up at the next lecture. Make sense? Usually I can tell fewer stories and get caught up before the exam. Um, and I looked at my notes. I, I, how many years did I say that we've been teaching the class? Eight? It's 10, this is my 10th year. I looked it up, I was like, holy smokes, it was actually 10. So, um, been doing it a while, kind of know the whole class, have it pretty dialed in. So if we feel like we're slipping behind, we will get caught up. And it won't be rapid fire. We'll, we'll just, I'll just get on fewer side tangents. That's what, that, I need to stay on tap. Um, everybody able to get onto the YouTube lecture site? You guys check that out. So I did load it that, that evening. I'll try to do the same thing tonight. I'll have today's lecture. It'll be kind of two parts. So it'll be the rest of introduction, which will be part two. And then I'll start out with cell injury, part one of two, because we're going to finish up the cell injury on uh, September 9th when we come back after the holiday week, right? We just called it a holiday week. We're giving you a fall break, like next week. How's that sound? Pretty cool. Burned out. What's that? You burned out already? Yeah, <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. Okay. What did one volcano say to the other? What did one volcano say to the other? I lava you. Huh? <laughs> Is it a song in Moana? Is it really? I should know that, actually. <laughs> My house, it's like a musical, honestly. It's like constant singing. Um, what type of music do mummies sing in the shower? What type of music do mummies sing in the shower? Rap music. <laughs> um, this is a joke that I made up that my kids didn't get. Okay, ready? What did the brother of Cell say to his sister when she stepped on his toe? My toe, sis. Right? <laughs> very good. That was good. Who did that? Oh, very good. I, I actually wrote that one down. My kid said, that is why we help you, Dad. It's not funny. Um, okay, last one. What do you call a cow with a twitch? Milkshake. Milkshake. There's an alternative answer. Beef jerky. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's get down to business with Barrett esophagus. So it's called Barrett, uh, not Barrett's. And this is our first disease that we're going to walk through. And we're going to characterize four aspects of this disease. Okay? So Barrett esophagus is a condition that... Um, 
folks with gastroesophageal reflux disease, abbreviated GERD, G-E-R-D, okay? So this is like heartburn is the common vernacular. So post-meal, a couple hours later, kind of get some stomach acid coming up, the esophagus, typically because the lower esophageal sphincter isn't closing well, okay? Uh, Middle-aged Caucasian males are primary the ones that wrestle with this disease. That's, that's the ethnic group that tends to wrestle with it the most, okay? Um, so gastroesophageal reflex disease, GERD. This is one aspect of the disease that puts us at risk of developing Barrett's. So Barrett's the disease and the genesis or the beginning is GERD. So if you have a patient or you have a family member that wrestles with heartburn and they just sort of deal with it, this is not a good solution. Because if you let this go, you're gonna see where this is gonna go, okay? About 10% of this population that wrestles with heartburn or gastroesophageal reflux disease develop ferret esophagus. So about 10% of this population develop why is it 10%? Well, we actually don't really know, but it seems to be pretty consistent within the literature. The third aspect is this prolonged injury. So what's happening is, what is the contents, what is the pH of the content in the stomach post-meal? It's pretty acidic, right? somewhere in the range of two to four, okay? Pretty acidic. Remember, low pH number means high acidity. So think about that lower esophageal sphincter that's right at, in between the interface of the openings of the stomach and the esophagus, okay? And it keeps contents inside the stomach. If that sphincter is weak, okay, or wears out over time, doesn't close completely, you get this regurgitation that comes up as the stomach is churning. And that acid moves up the esophagus and what leads to that burning sensation. What type of epithelium lines the esophagus? Stratified squamous, okay, stratified squamous. Uh, why, why is it stratified squamous in the esophagus? What's the function of stratified epithelium? What's that? Resist abrasion. Resist abrasion. So if you're eating food, the bolus comes down, there's a mechanical abrasion that's happening down the tube, okay? So that stratified squamous is not well equipped to deal with the acid content of the stomach. What's the epithelium in the stomach in contrast? It's not stratified squamous. What specialized cells in the stomach to help deal with the acid? Do you guys remember? Who said that? Goblet cells. Very well. Oh, very well done. Goblet cells. What do goblet cells make? They make a mucus, and it lines the surface of the stomach so that the acid content doesn't eat away at the stomach lining. You with me? So the epithelium in the esophagus is not designed for that purpose. So if you have this prolonged injury, we've got an issue. Does that make sense? That's why it burns. That's why most of the time when you are eating food and you release acid into the stomach, your stomach doesn't hurt if everything's going well because you have goblet cells and you have a mucous membrane that's lining the interface of the stomach to prevent erosion from hydrochloric acid. Remember, it's a chloride ion and hydrogen ion that are released and secreted into the stomach to make HCL. Hydrochloric acid is extremely caustic. If you spill hydrochloric acid on your skin in a chem lab, what do they tell you to do? After you're done screaming, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to rinse it off, flush it with water immediately, right? Because it'll burn your skin. So that's essentially that interface that's happening at the esophagus. So the last terminology or thing that's happening is what we call cellular metaplasia. Who can define, someone maybe that did the reading, who can define what this term metaplasia means? You guys see why I make slides? Because my writing is horrible. 
right here. Is that when? What's that? that when not not cells cells that weren't responsible for a certain um, activity take over the responsibility of those killed cells? So when certain cells that weren't designed for that activity start taking over, kind of, we're very close. It's not perfect, but it's pretty. It's down the right track. Yep. That's, that's perfect. So that's functionality, yes, you're, you're right, but what, what the answer that we really want to hear is when one cell type replaces another cell type, okay? So in the Greek, this term, metaplasia, comes from a Greek word, and it means to change in form. You guys remember, there's an old book in, in literature that we would read called Metamorphosis. Do you guys remember that book? Or do you know the term metamorphosis? Right, so metamorphosis, you know, similar similar prefix of metaplasia, right? So to change form, metamorphosis refers to like when a caterpillar goes into cocoon and then it becomes a, a butterfly. It, it goes through a metamorphosis into something else. So metaplasia means to change in form. So we essentially move from stratified squamous to goblet containing epithelium. And I'm gonna show you some histology that proves that. Okay, so let's look more at Barrett. So we've got chronic GERD. There is a injury that's taking place. This injury that takes place is um, at the level of the stratified squamous epithelium. We talked about how 10% of GERD patients develop Barrett. We're not really certain as to why the 90% are fine and the 10% are susceptible to it. Probably something genetic that predisposes it to them. But the biggest problem is if you develop this Barrett disease, this is basically a precursor to what we call an esophageal adenocarcinoma. Okay, so that's a big word. So esophageal and adeno carcinoma, okay? Throat cancer, plain and simple. So I wanna use this example because you're gonna see throughout the entire semester that this type of process with this one example of Barrett, we will refer back to it all semester. A lot of these processes follow the exact same thing from a disease state. So you've got some sort of uh, issue going on, right, an etiology. You've got a, per, a predominant group of the population that might be genetically predisposed to developing that type of problem. There's injury that takes place. A lot of times that injury causes an inflammatory event. And if that's chronic, chronic meaning long-term, not acute meaning short-term, then stuff is going to alter and you get into a pathological condition. And that's the cellular metaplasia. And if this continues, right, it moves to Barrett. And if that continues, it mutates to cancer. Does that make sense? So that's the progression of, of Barrett. And let's look grossly. We said macro view. Remember on Monday we talked about kind of the four things that we're going to look at? So let's look at a macro view. I'm going to kill these lights for a second. Oh. There it is. I used to lecture across the hall mostly, and, and I brought my label maker in, which I might do, and I actually labeled all the switches, because that's kind of how I am, but also it's very helpful, because then you're not just randomly flipping switches. Um, okay, so you've got two views down the throat, down the esophagus, okay? This is a scope, and on the left image, your left, is normal esophageal epithelium, so you could write on there normal, so you remember, okay? If you Print out your slides. Or just if you're making notes, on this slide, the left one is normal, the right one is Barrett. 
Okay. So what are some of the observations you have on the left? Just chat it out. What do you notice between the two differences? Normal on the left, diseased on the right. But it's part of smaller. A little smaller diameter opening. Okay. That's an observation. Don't know if that's clinically significant. I don't know the size of the patient. It could be, you know, the opening is basically because the, the patient on your right is slightly larger, but that's a good observation. What else do you notice? Inflammation. Where do you see the inflammation? On the right or the left? On the right, what's the inflammation? What areas would be highlighting hot spots of inflammation? The, the reddish color in the tissue. Do you notice these white, um, shiny surfaces on the left. So that's your stratified squamous that's moist, okay? It's slippery. And so it is um, hydrated. You, you don't see that on the right. You've lost this glistening epithelium that's a sort of slippery surface when it's wet, okay? You don't see that on the right. So this is the gross observation. And if this progresses on the right, the ferret is what you're seeing, then you're going to develop a um, esophageal adenocarcinoma. And that's that protrusion that's happening inside the lumen that's not supposed to be there. Now, typically these are relatively benign, meaning you're not gonna metastasize and go somewhere. So you can take care of them by clipping them off, surgically resecting them, but if left uncontrolled, this could progress all the way throughout the throat, right? So now let's look at the micro, or the histology. Again, what we said we are going to do on Monday. So the, the green arrow is pointing to essentially, quote unquote, normal stratified squamous epithelium at this interface that's about two centimeters superior to the, esoph the, the upper esoph or sorry, the lower esophageal sphincter, okay? And so you can see that it's nice and flat, it's elongated, it's a stratified squamous epithelium that kind of looks like this, right? And then if you look at the red arrow, it might be hard to appreciate on this slide, um, depending upon how close or how far you are from the screen, but hopefully what you can see is you can see the goblet cells. So you can see the goblet epithelium, you see this white pouch? That's the goblet epithelium that's dumping its mucus onto that surface. So at this transition zone is where we're moving into cellular uh, metaplasia, where we've transitioned from the green, which is what we're supposed to have, we've transitioned to goblet containing, there's some more goblet cells right here. You can see right here there are goblet cells. So there's actually a goblet cell right there adjacent to where the normal epithelium ends. Does that make sense? And there's no sphincter. There's no esophageal sphincter here. So you're in an area where it's supposed to be stratified squamous. So the fact that you're seeing histology that demonstrates goblet epithelium, it tells you histologically that you've got a disease state. Does that make sense? So if they came in clinically and they took this out, and they ran pathology on it, right? So I was sending it out for pathology. What, what the heck does that mean, right? Oh, oh, it's gonna take like three weeks for it to come back. Well, they, they process that tissue, and they create a microscope slide. And usually it's about a six to 10 micron slice of tissue, and then they stain it. And this is a hematoxylin and niacin stain, one of the most common stains in pathology. Hematoxylin is uh, like a pink color, and niacin is the purple, and the pink stains collagen like this pink vibrant color, and the purple colors the nuclei with these dots, purple dots. Okay, so you can see all the purple dots, those are all the nuclei. So this is a very common hematoxylin and eosin, abbreviated H and E stain. And this would come back after a couple of weeks and they would say, yes, Mr. Smith, um, we need to talk. We need to actually control your heartburn because you definitely have cellular metaplasia happening. And Mr. Smith says, what do I have? He says, you have the early signs of throat cancer. Oh crap, okay. Does that make sense, what we just talked about? Okay, questions on that? In the back. So did you bring this upon yourself by anemia and anorexia without developing periods? 
Oh, okay. So the, the question about some eating disorders, could you bring this about on yourself? So, so anorexia typically from an eating disorder is a, is a restrictive disorder, so they restrict intake. Not as much as with um, bulimia, where you actually, the individual um, will eat the meal and then later on will regurgitate it. So yeah, you're gonna have this kind of problem associated with chronic bulimia. It's a good question, an unfortunate situation, but yeah, that's true. Okay, so what's causing this cellular metaplasia? Oh, sweet, I got it right. Okay. Um, how does it know to switch? And why does it switch? Like what was said over here, very well between the two is, one cell type takes over for another cell type. How, how does it know to do that? Why does it do that? And what's taking place? So if you think back to the integument or the skin, like in 201, you guys remember? That might have been a long time ago. But one of the things that's cool about this class is we get to synthesize a lot of information from prior classes. And I get students who will say, hey, I don't have the prereqs, but I think I can do this. I don't let students in typically without the prereqs because you need to have kind of this familiarity with what we're talking about. And if it's been a long time since you've heard about the esophageal sphincter, you can probably go look it up and it'll come back like that, right? But now if we start talking about the integument, do you guys remember which layer was the stem progenitor cell of the integument? Heard it over here, you wanna say it a little louder? The stratum, basali, or basal la layer, that's absolutely correct. So that was the deepest layer of the integument, right, or the skin, and that was the turnover location. And about every six to eight weeks, those cells in the stratum basali layer, or the stratum basal layer, depending on how you wanna say it, they differentiate, they turn into the next layer. And then it turns into the next layer. And then slowly over time, you get to the stratum corneum, and it's flattened, and it sloughs off. And that's the turnover. Where the beginning of that tissue forms is at that stem layer. So the epithelium that lines the throat or the esophagus is very similar. And so if there's a mutation at that layer, that's the stem layer or the progenitor layer, if that mutation happens, it's gonna give rise to a next generation of mutated cells. Does that make sense? And so that's how it happens, is you actually have prolonged injury and it causes stem cell differentiation to go into a different direction than it normally would. So instead of becoming stratified squamous epithelium, that stem cell, progenitor cell, differentiates and becomes a goblet epithelium or a goblet-containing epithelium, okay? So, some white space here where you can write it down. So I wanna talk a little bit about the different types of stem cells. So if we're at the skin, stratum basali layer of the skin, bless you, or we're at the epithelium of the esophagus, and we're talking about a stem cell, is it, is it an embryonic stem cell at that state? If it's in URI or a 40-year-old Caucasian male that's wrestling with this? Or is it a um, adult stem cell, embryonic or adult? Those are your big categories. Which is it? Adult. It's adult, okay? So the delineation is after birth, that tissue now becomes adult. Prior to birth, it's actually considered embryonic, okay? So embryonic refers to in utero, and adult refers to post natal. Now, there's different delineations of adult-derived stem cells. There's young tissue, like stem cells that you pull out of the umbilical cord or the placenta, um, and then maybe stem cells that would come from like a bone marrow donation of a teenager or a 20-year-old, some of you. And then there's geriatric stem cells, right? Stem cells that come later in life that aren't nearly as pluripotent. They don't have quite the potential to become new tissue the older they are. And that's one of the reasons the aging process is so problematic. Right? Healing is much better when you're young than it is when you're old because your stem cells start to wear out. So we've got embryonic versus adult, right? And 
And then under adult, we have young and we have old. <clears throat> now there's a third category which is called IPCs, induced pluripotent cell. So an induced pluripotent cell actually is an adult cell, usually they're young, and then you transfect them with transcription factors to make them believe that they're back in an embryonic state. And this was the solution by some very creative scientists because of all of the controversy around embryonic source tissue. Because typically if you harvest an embryonic stem cell, you compromise the organism it came from. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of ethical questions about should we be doing anything with embryonic tissue? So a lot of clever scientists came up with induced pluripotent where you take young stem cells, you transfect them to make them think they're back in an embryonic state. Okay, I see if this works. I inserted a video <coughs> that I wanted to play for you. Uh, it actually comes from a company. Oh, where'd it go? Let's do this. Uh, let me find it. this video for you so that you can kind of appreciate what these stem cells look like as they grow in culture. Sorry about this. I had it all queued up and I must not have hit save. So this is a regenerative medicine company that um, I'm a part of, and we culture stem cells. These are adult stem cells. And so that's one stem cell there that's now divided into two. And this is time-lapse video, so this is a like a 24-hour process that you're seeing in maybe a minute, okay? And so you can see the, that one cell divided into two, and now it's starting to differentiate. We've given it, you can see in the video, like off on the left, you'll see stuff floating by really fast. Like there's no flow, it's just stuff is naturally moving, but it's sped up. So now you can see that these cells are budding and they're changing their shape. They're actually producing growth factors and cytokines and they're dumping them out into their environment. And over time, if we let this go for a couple of days, they would differentiate, they would no longer be stem cells. They would turn into a neuron. They would turn on into a fibroblast. They would turn into a muscle cell. And we could actually give it signals and cues to say become this, this, or that. So back to our clinical example. If these progenitor cells have the ability to become all sorts of different things, and they get an injury stimulus that's chronic, who knows what's gonna happen, does that make sense? So that's how this propagates, is you've got the progenitor layer, the stem layer, that's seeing this injury stimulus, and a lot of times it's inflammation, and that's exactly what's happening here. And that propagates over time, and now that stem cell is being convinced to do something it's not normally supposed to do. It's very plastic, so it's easily influenced by its surroundings, and it becomes something different than what it was originally intended for. Does that make sense? All right, that was supposed to be inserted here, but we didn't get it. Okay, Barrett, finishing up Barrett, usually 40 to 60 year old Caucasian males are the population that's most at risk. There's a localized ulceration that takes place of that tissue where it's being eroded by the hydrochloric acid, the HCL. And if it's greater than three centimeters of Barrett condition, now you're 30 to 40 more times more likely to develop esophageal adenocarcinoma. That's what goes in that blood. Okay, so your risk factor goes up by 30 to 40 times if you have 
three centimeters or more of that red looking epithelium on a scope. Are you with me? So the advancement is very, very close to becoming dysplasia. Here's another term that you would have caught in your readings. So dysplasia comes from the Greek difficulty or a difficult formation. So it's referring pathologically to an abnormal tissue, like when you have that neoplasia or that lesion that we saw sitting in the lumen. That growth that was benign shouldn't be there. So that's a dysplasia, that's an abnormal growth. And this is getting closer and closer to cancer. We'll have a whole section on cancer and we're gonna compare and contrast benign versus malignant. So for right now, don't worry about that. Okay, don't worry about benign versus malignant other than benign is something that isn't likely gonna break off and go other places in the body and something that's malignant is going to break off or metastasize and go somewhere else, okay? So this is a commonality that's found throughout the intestinal tract not just at the esophagus. So I wanna show you, um, and again, all this histology is from the DVD, but like I promised you, from an exam standpoint, if I'm gonna give you histology, it'll come out of the stuff that we've covered. I'm not gonna put on the exam some random piece of histology that you've never seen before. Does that make sense? Okay, this is a 300 level general pathology class, so you're not supposed to be looking at slides and mastering how to be a pathologist. This is to give you a sense of um, appreciation for the field, okay? So, but it's very important that you pay attention to the slides that we talk about, discuss, and maybe take notes on it because these are totally fair game on the exam. And it might look exactly like that without the labels, for example, okay? So, on the left, you have normal stud, uh, stomach uh, duodenum interface, and we have these very classic um, structures known as Peyer's patches. So this came from a Swiss anatomist known as uh, Johann or Johann Peyer from the 17th century. He first discovered this, so they got it named after him. I bet his mom was so proud. And these are normal uh, lymph node tissues or lymphoid tissues, the Peyer's patches. So lymphoid tissue is part of the immune system. And so the function of having these Peyer patches in the epithelium that lines the intestinal tract is if something invades, if you consume something and there's some um, contaminant, a bacteria or a virus or something harmful that's in what you consume, the Peyer's patches are right there at that interface to send out um, cells that are gonna fight that foreign object. Does that make sense? So we'll get to immunology and you'll understand a little bit more about lymphoid tissue. But basically we'll have T cells that will go attack foreign objects because of these pyrus patches. So this is what it normally looks like. You can kind of appreciate the invaginations that take place in the, in the lining to increase the surface area, right, for absorption or for secretion. And then this is a chronic peptic ulcer at the level of the stomach. So similar type of thing. If the epithelium in the stomach or the duodenum, the small intestine, which is distal or downstream from the stomach, when the gastric emptying takes place and the stomach contents leave and they go into the small intestine or the duodenum, you have a lot of acid there as well. So if that breaks down, that interface breaks down, that lining breaks down, and you start getting inflammation at the level of the epithelium, you get remodeling. So what this is hematoxylin niacin, remember the pink and purple. So again, the purple stains the nuclei. Uh, so you can see all the purple dots inside of this tissue. There's a lot of purple dots, a lot of T cell activity in the lymphoid tissue, but you lose <coughs> all that lymphatic tissue. It just disappears, it erodes away. So you've lost your immune function. You have chronic inflammation that's happening here. Um, and you know that there's chronic inflammation because you see disintegration of the tissue. You see this white area that's kind of falling apart. It's becoming necrotic. And we'll get to that at the very end of today, and then we'll talk about that on the 9th when we come back. But you're starting to see tissue necrosis happening here because of erosion. So not just at the esophagus, this is distal to the stomach. This is an ulcer, okay? Or in the stomach, 
So this kind of stuff happens. Two clinical examples that we've already covered, very similar processes. Make sense? Questions so far on Barrett or ulcers or how we walk through the disease, what the manifestation is, maybe the gross observations, the microscopic observations, and then of course the clinical significance. Is there no plagia in the case of peptic ulcers? Yeah, there can be. Okay. So you can develop can uh, stomach cancer or small intestinal cancer. Yeah, so with the question about early on um, notification from patients about having a chronic peptic ulcer, ulcers are really tough to diagnose. Um, a lot of it is because the nerve endings that go throughout the GI tract are not very specific, and so it's more of a general pain versus a specific pain. Okay, so when you think about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic tree as it goes out into the periphery or the peripheral nervous system, um, when it comes to the integument or the, the thoracic or abdominal cavities, you have one nerve plexus that feeds a broad area. And so you get sort of general malaise. Like when you have an upset stomach, right, it's kind of the whole area feels awful. Whereas if you sprain your ankle, you're like, it's right there. Does that make sense? So the same kind of thing happens with these ulcers is it's more of a general malaise. It's, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on. So I, I have a, um, a coworker at a company, and uh, his wife was being diagnosed with, with gallbladder disease. And so she was actually um, yesterday down at John C. Lincoln in Phoenix, and they were scheduling her for a gallbladder removal. Well, um, they did a second, you know, uh, clinical uh, assessment, and she wasn't she wasn't tender in the spots that are very typical um, on on palpation. And so they said, well, we're not super convinced that it's gallbladder. So let's keep her for observation and let's wait. Now they shifted and said, well, maybe she has an ulcer. So, so, so again, they, they don't really know yet. The, the way that they're going to figure this out is they're going to put her back on food and they're going to add some fat and if it flares up, then that's usually a sign that the gallbladder isn't releasing bile to emulsify the fat and that's, that's very common. So that's how they'll figure it out and kind of go down the pathway of is it ulcer or is it, you know, they can give her, if, if the gallbladder doesn't flare up from a fat diet um, and she's still having, you know, pain chronically, they think it's ulcer, they can give her medications to kind of coat the stomach and see if it subsides. So it's not super exact science, you know, that's kind of why they call it, right, the practice of medicine. They try this, and they try that, and they try this, and, and a lot of times we get frustrated, like, hey, it seems like they don't know what they're doing. Well, no, this is how they figure out what's going on. And you know, if it's an orthopedic injury, a lot of times it's a little easier. If it's something in the GI system or abdominal pain, it's really difficult to figure out what it is. Good questions.